Welcome to another live episode of the Eric Crocker Show. I'm your host, former NFL and AFL defensive back Eric Crocker. And on today's show, we're going to be very, very positive. We're going to give everyone their flowers. Well, not everyone, but definitely Brock Purdy. And where I was wrong about Brock Purdy and really what he's doing right now, we're going to talk about Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel. Are they the best wide receiver duo in the NFL? And... Some young guys, I watched some film yesterday, did a little bit of film study, Diamondo Lenore, Jair Tig Brown. We're going to discuss those guys and much, much more. And also bring y'all on live so I can get your opinion on everything we talk about on today's show. But of course, this show is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, promo code Crocky. Make sure you go to Underdog Fantasy, download the app, and use promo code Crocky when they ask, how did you get to this app, all right? They will double your initial deposit up to $100, up to $100. I got Yazen, Yazen? We got Williams in the chat, and he says, let's go, Croc. Uh, did you hit on Underdog last night? I I hit, but I ain't hit, though. You know what I'm saying? I think I came up. Uh, actually, I think I won one play in the second half that covered all my plays for the day. So uh, probably a net of $5, maybe. Didn't really come up any money, but... Maybe y'all would have better luck than I had yesterday. So download the app or go to underdogfantasy.com. Use promo code Crocky for a double deposit up to $100. I sit and, first of all, all right, let's be very clear here. I played football. And, you know, obviously I got an opportunity to be at the highest level in the NFL for a short period of time with the Jets and stuff like that. And everybody thinks like, man, you know, playing football like that's a dream come true. And it's like, really? A dream come true for me. And, and that was amazing. But a dream come true for me is being able to talk about football. I have loved football. I mean, obsessed. Like, just the most obsessive thing I've, I've ever had in my life. I love my wife. Obsessed about her, too. But football, talking about football, I've always loved to do this. So I've watched a lot of football, seen a lot of things. I discuss football. Um, I have evaluated talent. I've done all these things. And this guy, Brock Purdy, comes around and he kind of really shakes up my entire world. All right. Uh Brock Purdy is is he's changing how we view, I don't even say how we view an elite quarterback, right? Because there, there's been some traits that you just naturally just not naturally, but you have to have to play the quarterback position. So you got to be accurate. You got to be able to, you know, play on time. Uh, you have to be able to just make throws. You got to be able to understand the offense. Like those things, that, that has never changed. But I think the way that he's doing it, where he was drafted, has really kind of shaken up a lot of people. And there are still a lot of people that are struggling with giving him his flowers. I think there are still a lot of people that are struggling with what exactly that it is that they're seeing. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm one of those guys. All right. So, uh, if you go a few months back or so, uh, this is while Trey Lance was still on the team. At no point did you guys ever, 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 ever hear me say that Trey Lance was better or had played better than Brock Purdy uh, in an NFL game or in a season. Like, I, I never said that. All right. But I always gave him the benefit of the doubt because, I mean, you got a small sample size. Like, let's see if, you know, Trey continues to improve, whatever. He has a really high upside, hard worker, doesn't have the reps, et cetera, right? So I told you all these reasons why I would have kept Lance around and at least let him compete. They ended up training him. I also saw that coming as well. But with Brock Purdy and what – oh, I said I was saying, uh, there was an episode where I was like, man, you better hope that Trey Lance is – and this is where Eric Crocker was wrong, all right? I said, you better hope that Lance reaches his full potential because if not, it's going to be really hard to win a Super Bowl. Like Brock Purdy, like he's good. Like, yeah, but – Man, you're you're hitching your wagon on this, you know, six foot, two hundred fifteen pound quarterback. Doesn't have the biggest of arms, you know. Everything went great for him last year. You know, it was all perfect around him, right? Like, is he going to continue that? And I'll be damned. Brock Purdy has continued it, all right, and not just continued playing well, but has played well to the highest extent, to the point where we are talking about MV Purdy. All right, we're talking about MVP. We're talking about right now uh, in Vegas or anywhere you bet, Brock Purdy is the leader in uh, odds for MVP. Like he has the best odds to win it. And I started to think about like, how did we get here? 
Okay. And there is still one thing that I do want to see. I talked to my guy, Chris, about this. He's like, Croc, you need to talk about this on your show. I'm like, mom, I'm not going to talk about it because they're going to think I'm hating. But I'm not hating. There's one thing I would still like to see. We'll get to that in a minute. All right. But first and foremost, Brock Purdy, one thing he has done since showing up has been an amazing facilitator. I think he has done very well. Uh, I feel very comfortable when he's back there throwing the ball. I never hold my breath before he throws the ball. Matter of fact, uh, I feel like on the other end of it, there's going to be a big completion or a big gain or things are going to go like in a positive direction for the 49ers. Like that's what it feels every time. All right. Uh, obviously he doesn't have the biggest of arm and I don't think you need to have a big arm to be good at the NFL. I always say, well, you don't need a big arm until you need a big arm. Like that's kind of my saying. I say it with speed as well. Uh, you don't need speed until you need speed. And uh, if you are a quarterback that understands, I don't have a Josh Allen arm. You can play in a way to where you don't need to have a Josh Allen arm. And that's what we see 99% of the time from Brock Purdy, which I, I'm not going to lie. I did not think that that was possible. Uh, I think everyone thinks that you have to have this amazing arm to be good at the NFL level. And I don't think so. Or you have to be able to throw like Josh Allen. I don't think so either. It helps, right, to be able to launch a ball. But also with some of those guys, you see, they aren't as great with anticipatory throws. Well, why? Because they can rely on their arm strength to drill a ball in there. So they can wait a tick longer. And I think we saw some of that from Trey Lance as well, right? Not playing on time, uh, waiting. And then, okay, I'm just going to throw a fastball in there. We see that with Josh Allen. We see that with Mahomes. It gets him in trouble a lot as well. But really, on a consistent basis, you know what I'm saying, 99, 90% of the time is going to be how well are you seeing the field? How well are you reading defenses? And are you understanding what the offense is asking of you? And I would say right now with Brock Purdy, uh, he's doing that at the highest level, not just, you know, for the 49ers and their offense. And, and I've said all along, really this year, I'd say by week five, I was like, there's nobody functioning at a higher level in their offense as Brock Purdy is in his offense. Like he's, I don't know how much better you can play in the offense that we're seeing Brock. Now, does he have some things that benefit him or whatever. Yeah. You know, he has some terrific weapons. Uh, you know, he has a terrific offensive mind with his head coach. Uh, you know, you can watch a game and just see, you know, man, there's some good things that it, he's set up in a good situation, but at the end of the day, you still have to deliver. And he's not only delivering, I could see if it like got really weird at times, it doesn't really get weird until one moment. I'll tell you that one moment where it does get a little weird, but for the most part, when you look at the MVP talk, I understand how you might look at it and be like, oh, is he an MVP quarterback? Because he makes it look so easy. I put, I wrote some stats down here. He's had back-to-back 300-yard-plus -back passing games. All right, Almost 700 yards in the last two games. Six touchdowns to one interception. And the one interception, it could have been a miscommunication. You had IU come straight down the stem. Uh, you had uh, Purdy trying to lead him a little bit more, thought he was going to kind of bring it in a little bit more and hook it up, whatever. Miscommunication on those guys went off Ayuk's hands, intercepted. All right. But outside of that, man, he's been playing football at a really high level. All right. Uh, you know, I think he's leading in pr most of the important stats right now. Completion percentage, he's balling, right? 73% of his passes, he's completing. That's amazing. But to me, it's like, I don't really care so much about that because, you know, your completion percentage, it can be inflated by, you know, uh, screens and things like that. He ain't doing a whole lot of screens. Matter of fact, out of like uh, most of the quarterbacks right now that we would talk about, especially like the last MVPs, and I've seen this stat flowing around, he has the lowest, matter of fact, oh, excuse me. He is, he is 28th in his completions at or around or at or behind the line of scrimmage. So he ain't throwing a lot of screens. And I hear this check down thing with 49er quarterbacks. We heard it with Jimmy Garoppolo. I'm like, Jimmy Garoppolo is not checking the ball down. Now he might play in timing and rhythm, and he might play slant and hit these windows, but he's not really checking down. It's just a, kind of a, more of the offense or whatever. Well, Brock is not only doing that, he's hitting the deep throws at a higher percentage of anyone else. Uh, he's been extremely efficient. I think last year we saw that – he was number one by a large margin in the history of like in the NFL in passes 10 to 20 yards, like by a wide margin, like number one completion. Percent. Like, and they're like, oh, there's no way he can sustain that. Well, I'll be damned. He sustained that. So at some point, even someone like me who was skeptical, all right, skeptical and thinking like, ah, like I, I there's going to be maybe some coming down 
to earth moment. And then, okay, when that happens, like, you know, what goes on from there? I haven't really seen a come down to earth moment. All right. Not in the sense of like just his play. I feel like every game, even in the Vikings game, even in the Bengals games, I thought, you know, I think he played very well outside of this one moment when we kind of needed him to play well in that moment as well. And, and, and maybe he got a little tight. We'll, we'll discuss that as well because I'm going to get to that. But overall, there was a lot of talk about Brock Purdy being the MVP. You continue to see people kind of pushing back. But from what it looks like to me, again, there's nobody really playing the quarterback position better than Brock Purdy right now. So uh, definitely should be MVP. I know Dak Prescott is in the conversation. I see Manly Shavers in here. And he says uh, they just put Dak over Brock Purdy for now. So maybe that had to do with the Philadelphia Eagles win. Uh, I can understand that, even though 49 just beat them. And he threw for, what, four touchdowns or whatever it was. All right, but um, I understand. Like, I understand. If, you, if you're like, okay, Dak Prescott, like, he is playing very well. But, man, Brock, he has shut a lot of people up. And I think a lot of it has to do with, one, like, where he was selected. You typically do not. You don't see that. You know what I'm saying? You don't see a seventh-round guy, smaller, uh, looking a little frenetic at times, uh, doesn't have the big arm, play well. Then even when he does, it's like, okay, there's going to be that coming down to earth moment. And it just hasn't. He's just been good, 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 and like really kind of getting better and better and better. So uh, you won't hear any pushback from me on how good he is. If you guys say he's the best quarterback ever in the next Joe Montana, I believe you. Like I won't push back on that. Uh, there are certain players where – once they do certain things, I'm just like, okay, you won't hear me push back against any agenda or whatever is out there. I would like to see one thing. We got to stop addressing weirdos, all right, as a 49er fan base, okay? We got to st stop addressing either weirdos or people with weird takes. If somebody like, uh, you know, Shady McCoy or whatever wants to continue to say, oh, he's this and that, or I see it on social media, then 49er shoes. I saw KBR. KBR came out and was like, all you throws is check downs. Like, the people that are saying that aren't watching the games. Like, stop talking to those people and stop wasting your energy on those people. That's one thing I do a really good job of. Once it's like, okay, you're just talking out of your ass, like, I'm going to stop responding. Like, I have nothing to say to you. Okay, and I see 49er fans, they continue to, well, I thought all he does is do this. Stop addressing those people. Stop addressing those people. They are uh, irrelevant to what's going on. Brock Purdy is playing at an MVP level. Uh, he's either one or two right now. I said Dak Prescott might be over him. but. Let him just continue to do what he's doing, which is cook. Now, there is one area. I just said a lot of great, glowing remarks about Brock and how amazing I think he's playing. I'm not pushing back on any. It, great. He's balling. The one last thing I need to see is I need to see that killer. Like, I need to see that killer. It, it, and he's had opportunities to do it, and it's like, ah. Eh. Right? Vikings game, like, go be a killer. Right, he got concussed. That's not on him. Bengals game, he had an opportunity. Be a killer. That's like, oh, I throw, throw, throw an interception. Oh, throw another interception. Oh, I actually throw another interception, but that interception gets called back. Then I fumble the very next play, right? So he has had some moments to be that killer. And this is uh, a conversation that myself, my guy Chris Roscoe, we were talking about it. And I'm like, man, he's playing amazing. I just, this is the last thing I kind of want to see. And I think sometimes when I say things like that, people think I'm like dogging somebody or anything like that. And it's like, nah, like, I just want to see it, bro. I just want to see, like, go be that killer. And when we talk about Tom Brady and why he's the greatest, right? Tom Brady is the greatest. Tom Brady was a killer. You know, when you have players on the sideline in the Atlanta game when the Falcons are up 28-3 uh, to and Muhammad Sanu is over there and he's like, mm, yeah, we're up, but uh, they got that guy Tom Brady over there. Like, that's just different. Now, Tom Brady is the greatest. And anytime you – you're going to mention in the same sentence of as Tom Brady or any other greats, like you're doing something right. So Brock is clearly on the right trajectory, but I'd say right now, that's the one thing like for, for me to just be like, he's 1 million percent the guy right now. I'm like, Oh, he's a thousand percent the guy. Right. So you got a hundred percent the guy he's passed that test. Thousand percent the guy. He's definitely there. 1 million percent the guy. I'm not quite there yet because I want to see that. Like just be a killer when it's rough. Be a killer when it's like everything is against us. Uh, nothing is going right. Defense not playing well, right? And this is me uh, trying to get the full picture of him. I have 98% of the picture of what Brock Purdy is. I see 98% of it. 
is complete, right? It's like something's loading, you know, you're waiting for something to load and you see the percentages going up. And we saw when he first came in, you see 5%, like, okay, he could play in the NFL. Then you see, you know, 20% is like, okay, maybe he could start. Then it's like, oh, he can win playoff games and the percentage keep going up. Then, oh, can he keep it going? Oh, he keeps it going. The percentages keep going up. And the last thing I want to see, can you be that killer? Can you be that stone cold killer? He has the confidence. He has the mindset. He has all that, but can you actually go out there and do it? And he's had a couple opportunities. And I ain't saying you can't have a bad game. I ain't saying you can't lose any games. Man, whatever. I just want to see, like, this year, can you show me a game? And, hey, if you blow everybody out and you win and you go to the Super Bowl and you blow everybody out, great. I feel like you're going to need him at some point to be that stone-cold killer. And uh, that's something that we see from all the greats. And I would like to see that from Brock. Now, I'm comparing him to these amazing guys, and we're talking about this, and we're talking about a guy who barely has more than a season worth of stats. So uh, to have this type of conversation about a quarterback this early in his career, so I think it says a lot about him doing uh, some really, really, really great things. I just want to feel like, feel that killer instinct. I see DJ Level says, uh, Raiders game last year, got kind of. Mm, like, it was cool. Like, oh, that was cool. That was cool. That was a cool game, but I need to see it like that, like that moment. My brother, BJ, you here? You in there? Oh, my brother must have stepped outside. I remember my brother was telling me this story about Tom Brady. And uh, my big cousin, Tyrone Gross, he played for the uh, San Diego Chargers at the time. This is what they were. And uh, he played running back. So my brother, my big brother, he would go to all, all of our cousins' games. And it was a playoff game. It's 2007. The Patriots are playing San Diego in San Diego. And the Patriots are down. They're down eight points late in the fourth quarter. And Tom Brady, just like the crowd is mother effing him. And, oh, you saw you, this, you, that. And Tom Brady's just standing there looking at the crowd, just standing there looking. I'll never forget my brother telling me this. And my brother's looking like, damn, what's wrong with this dude? He's like possessed. And he's just standing there looking at the crowd. And he was just like, and he started shaking his head, went on the field, just boom, 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 touchdown, boom, two-point conversion, boom, 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 field goal, win the game. And it's just like, damn, this dude, Tom Brady's a stone-cold killer, right? So uh, we'll see if 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 he can eventually be that. That's what we ultimately want. But right now, he's 98% of loaded. He's right there on the cusp of being like that guy, like that guy. And we're talking about this not even two years into his career, but I'm sold. Brock Purdy has been amazing has been amazing uh shout out to everybody that's in the chat right now hit the like button hit the subscribe button appreciate all the love and everybody contributing to a great show again the show is brought to you by Underdog fantasy use promo code crocky download the app and uh use crocky though dep double your deposit up to 100 dollars all right we got to talk about it we got to talk about it brandon Ayuk and debo samuel they're taking over. And my initial thoughts were just like, man, we look at this receiving group and kind of the usage of it. And one guy can have a great game. The other guy's not have a great game. They kind of take a backseat. Another guy can have a great game. Then the other guys kind of take a backseat to that. Matter of fact, I want to say it was Matt Mayoko, Matt Barrows. Don't quote me on this. It was one of those two guys. They put out a stat that showed the 49ers receiving leaders through, at the time, it was like 12 games. And George Kittle. Four times led the 49ers in receiving in the game. Brandon Knight, four times led the 49ers in receiving in the game. Debo Samuel, four times led the 49ers in receiving in the game. So that has probably since changed because I want to say it's been like two or so games since uh, that stat was out there. Maybe one game, however, however many games they played. All right. But it has been great just seeing how those guys either kind of take turns or get off together. And if you look at last games, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I know Brandon Ayuk had a ton of yards, over 120 plus yards. Yeah, Debo Samuel have another terrific game coming off of the heels of Philly game, which I love because one, he talked that talk and he going to really back it up. But two, uh, you know, it was a time where guys were, oh, he's a running back. Oh, Darius Slay got just as many touchdowns as him. They were talking a lot. They were talking crazy. And since then, Debo was like, all right, I'm just going to go on a tear, and I'm really going to show all y'all. So he has definitely shown everyone. And I started to think, like, is this the best duo in the NFL? I think prior to the season, you would say, man, there's some really good duos, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Uh, you got Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, right? Uh, and you kind of go around the league, and you see, like, man, there's some really good 
duos of receivers in the NFL. But I'd say if you told me on any given game, like two guys that are most likely to just really be able to go off and have their way with a defense, say Debo, Samuel, Brandon, Ayu. And I think I have talked a lot. My brother, he's a Cowboy fan. He's a CD, CD Lamb guy. And I'm like, man, if Ayuk had the opportunities that Lamb has, like, bro, he'd go crazy, right? But you never know who's going to get the ball. You never know who's going to get the targets. And maybe that's uh, a good thing for all these guys because there is a little bit more. I don't want to say misdirection, but these guys, uh, there's a little bit more mystery between who's going to get the ball on a certain play as opposed to uh, Keenan Allen, right? And I love Keenan Allen, and I put out a tweet yesterday like, man, Keenan Allen, are we talking about this guy being a little underrated? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is Keenan Allen underrated? Like, do we have to start having a conversation about him being a top seven receiver in the NFL? But with everything that, you know, you know he's getting the ball. You know Keenan Allen, uh, they're going to go to him. You know they're going to target him more than any other receiver in the NFL. And he still figures out a way to get open, catch passes. He leads the NFL in receptions right now. With the 49ers, you don't know who's going to get the ball. But when they do, they do some special things. They get the ball in their hands. So, um I want to give flowers to Debo Samuel. I want to give flowers to Brandon Ayuk because collectively as a group, and it's not just them. There's George Kittle. There's Chris McCaffrey. Uh, but, and obviously, Brock Purdy doing a terrific job of facilitating to those guys. But their playmaking ability in the areas that they win, I think they complement each other extremely well. I think they're the best wide receiver group in the NFL. So you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm seeing a lot of really good, a lot of really good stuff from those two receivers. And at any moment, at any moment, they can take over an entire game. So that is awesome. That is awesome. We got Eddie in the chat. He says, Croc, Debo is at 769 yards and Kittle is at 811. There's a chance that they get 1,000 yards plus I can CMC already over 1,000. So CMC over 1,000 rushing, doing a terrific job receiving as well. Brandon Ayuk over 1,000 yards receiving. And I think it's, if he told me at the end of the year he has 1,300 yards, I believe you. Uh, George Kittle. And Debo Samuel, both about 200 yards shy of 1,000 yards. To have three 1,000-yard receivers, that would be amazing. Because I, I don't think that's ever happened with the 49ers. I feel like their best chance was Jerry Rice, Terrell Owens, and J.J. Stokes. And that didn't happen. I don't think J.J. Stokes went crazy like that. So, uh, yeah, big-time stuff by those guys and, and everything that they're, what they're doing. Good stuff. Shout out to my guy, Silverado Kev, in the chat. And I'll try to get to all the comments. I'm actually going to bring you guys on here as well. So uh, I'll get to all the comments. Silverado Kev says, I remember stating in the offseason I wanted to see Debo be more involved in the traditional passing game and how it would uh, make us a much better. Well, oh, I remember stating. Okay. Well, you see it happening as we speak. Love it. You know, I don't even know if he's been, been involved like super as a – you know, there's still – it's either – Almost like boomer bust. It's like there's a slant, there's a screen, and then a, a deep crosser. Like so, there's still areas where I feel like, and again, this is a testament to Debo for him to be as good as he is, as productive as he is, and me still feel like, bro, there's an area where Debo can still get better at these things, and like really like solidify himself as a top ten receiver because right now he's a top ten weapon for sure. Right, uh, he just win so many different ways. But, man, like, if he really was like, all right, I'm going to become more of a nuanced route runner. And that's not his game. Like Debo will tell you. I understand, Debo. But if he ever did say, you know what, this offseason, I'm going to really take it serious. I'm going to go get with uh, – shout out to Dub Williams. And I don't even know if Coach Dub from Stockton, California, went to Tokyo High School, same high school as me. I don't even know if Coach Dub is able to train other NFL guys now because he uh, coaches for the Baltimore Ravens now. But let's say Debo went and got with Coach Dub. And he just was like, this offseason, I'm just going to drill it, drill it, drill it. He would be a technician. So then you get the run after catch Debo that we have right now, the, the running back version of Debo, and then a pure route runner and a guy who can already stretch the field. That would be a dangerous, 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 dangerous version of Debo Samuel. So not sure we'll see it. He wins how he wins, and I think he does that at a very high level. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Appreciate everybody in the chat. We've got one more thing we want to talk about real quick, a little film study that I watched, all right? So, Jarrell Brown, Diamador, Lenore. I watched those two guys. And let's start with Jarrell Brown. 
we talked a little bit about this on Locked On 49ers. If you don't listen, you know, we, five days a week, you got the audio version, you got the video version, wherever you get your Locked On information with myself, Brian Peacock. All right. But we talked a little bit about it and we talked about Jair Brown. And a lot of people have asked us, like, you know, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? So I'm like, you know what? I haven't watched all 22, but let me go to the all 22 and see. And I'm like, let me look at the most recent game. So, you know, you got Seattle, you got Philadelphia Eagles. The very first play in the Philadelphia Eagles game, blown coverage. Uh, he came down. And I wouldn't even say a blown coverage because a lot of times a blown coverage is a play that, uh, you know, guys are maybe confused on the back end. There wasn't no confusion. He just he disguises a lot, and I think he does that very well. First of all, they use him in very multiple ways. He could be a two-high safety, single-high safety. He could play in the box. I watched him guard Devontae Smith in the slot. I watched him guard tight ends in the slot. So he, he can cover. I think he, had, he was very fluid. He has a really good understanding of what's going on. Like, all those things are correct. But – they ask him to do a lot of, you know, hey, we're not just going to line up in whatever coverage we're running. You know, we're going to disguise things. We're going to come down. We're going to go, you know, too high, show too high, go, go down the single high. You know, they use him a lot as a robber. They do a lot of different things with him. On this play, and I'll never pretend to understand exactly what a uh, uh, what they're told in meetings. I, I don't know. But just, I'll tell you what it looked like. He's disguising. He comes down. Comes down a little too out of control, and the tight end just blows right by him. And he has him beat by five, six yards or so. Uh, and luckily, quarterback threw a – and this is Jalen Hurts. He threw like a five-yard pass, did not throw it downfield because it would have been a big play. Uh, that happened again, I believe, in the second quarter where he kind of – same thing, kind of overplayed it, got outran. This one might have been a touchdown. It could have been like a 70-yard play. Quarterback didn't see it. So uh, Jalen Hurts didn't play very well in that game. All right, but – you saw those things. But outside of that, man, you're seeing versatility. We're seeing single high. I think he has really good instincts from a single high, being able to run sideline to sideline. Obviously, we know he's not the fastest of guys. And if he gets caught having a match on a vertically pushing route from a uh, slot receiver that's a little speedy, that can be trouble. So if I were an NFL uh, offensive coordinator, I would try to figure out if I can get – uh, him singled up on a speedy receiver up the seam or, you know, with a two-way go. Like, that's what I would do. I would I would be looking at how can I how can I single this guy up and have a two-way go on him and try to beat him because I don't think he's the fastest. But I think he does a terrific job understanding who he is and what he isn't, um, you know, what his strengths are, weaknesses, and really him, how smart he is, I think he does a really good job with, for the most part, putting himself in playmaking positions. I saw him jump routes. I saw him undercut routes. Uh, obviously, we see the, the interceptions that he's had, uh, a terrific job from a single high. Matter of fact, he almost had two. He had one in – shoot, he could have had three in the game against Seattle. He had one single high, sideline, jumps, intercepts the ball, uh, intended for DK Metcalf. In the first quarter of that game, single high. Uh, they threw the ball down the right sideline. I don't know who Traverius Ward was guarding, but Traverius Ward was there as well. He was in great position to pick that ball off. He was a single high safety, got a good jump and read on it. And there was another one where the quarterback's arm got hit and Fred Warner picked it off. But if you look at who's waiting right there, Fred Warner didn't get it. It was Jair Brown. And even after the interception, he's just standing there like, did I just take my pick? Right? He, he was literally, it was like an arm punt. All right, so he almost had three. But he was the playmaker. So this shouldn't be anything that is a surprise. You know, and he only played two years at Penn State. Uh, he was a junior college transfer. He had 10 interceptions in those two years, led college football with the most interceptions over that time. So this is a guy that was a playmaker. He came in, got an interception in his first game against Tampa, you know, and it's like, well, of course, first real action against Tampa. And it's like, well, of course, he's a playmaker. And I think he's a guy that's going to continue to make plays. So uh, I'm excited to continue to watch his development. And when I cut on the All-22, I would like to see less of the blown assignments. And I say blown assignments. It's just getting beat, maybe being a little bit overly aggressive. I would like to see him be, be a little bit, do a little bit better from that standpoint, but just in the sense of his ability, I have liked everything that I've seen. A lot of good ability. Yeah, not the fastest guy. So there's things I would ask of Jimmy Ward, or at least I'd be more comfortable asking Jimmy Ward to do these things as opposed to him. But clearly uh, the playmaking skills are there and he is smart. So uh, really like a lot of what I've seen from Jair Brown so far. Now on the other side, we got Diamondo Lenore and, Diamondo Lenore is, has been a Swiss Army knife. Shout out to the 49ers coaches staff. They, ter they do a terrific job of finding these guys in the fifth round. Listen, I know we get really excited about guys, you know, just 
every draft pick. Like, oh man, this guy's gonna be awesome. But I would assume, and I've never been in one of those rooms, but I would assume that a lot of these guys in the fifth rounds is just like, all right, you know, we'll see what we get from this guy. You know, if we like some of the stuff he has, you know, maybe he's missing this, missing that. That's why he's a later round pick, right? But we'll, we'll just see. Now, I think they've done a terrific job of it. Well, we'll just see about this guy. They've been great with those guys. Well, Diamond Lenoir, I'm not saying he's this long term shut down corner, but I will say uh, the 49ers went to three straight NFC championship games with a guy by the name of Terrell Brown. And I would say that Diamondo Lenore reminds me of a Terrell Brown. Like he reminds me of that guy where it's like, man, I got you three years starter, four years starter for the 49ers, go somewhere else, make some money and start. I could see him being that guy. Now, the fortunate thing for the 49ers, they got to groom Terrell Brown for the first three years. He just did not play. Uh, was more of a special teamers. And I think he even at Texas maybe played safety and converted to a corner at, for the 49ers. But for the first three years, it was him kind of sitting there. And then in the last year, they kind of like re-signed him. And then next you know, he's a starter under um, Jim Harbaugh and ends up starting for three, four years for the 49ers before ultimately, I think it was like going to the Raiders or whatever in free agency. I feel like that is Diamondo Lenore. And he's shown great versatility, being able to play inside when they need it, uh, being able to play outside when they need it. I think ideally, he could really play both. Uh, you know, watching him against the Philadelphia Eagles and how he was covering the slot, I thought he plastered to receivers very well. Uh, the biggest thing was lack of separation. And there are plays, again, when you're in the slot, there's just a lot of space. So at times, there's going to be that separation. But I thought he did a good job of making sure that that wasn't consistent uh, throughout the game. And then you watch him this last game, the job he did on DK Metcalf, a guy that has like six inches on you and how aggressive he was with him, you know, at the catch point, got called for PI one time, but I thought he did a terrific job of being just aggressive regardless with a guy that comes off as trying to be the bully all the time. So uh, I actually really like DK Metcalf, but it was great to watch a guy like Diamond Lenore uh, really kind of get in his chest and play really physical and aggressive with him. All right, here we go. Now, we are going to get y'all on live. So I just put the link in the chat. Anybody that wants to come on live, come on. Let's hear it. We've talked about Brock Purdy and how amazing he has played. We talked about the best duo, in my opinion, uh, as far as receivers go in the NFL with Debo Samuel and uh, Brandon Ayuk. <laughs> All right, and how well those guys are playing. And then we talked about a couple young guns as well. But I would love to kind of – I would kind of scour through – the chat right now see some of the things that y'all are talking about here uh we got angelo cruz he says why is bp not in the conversation for comeback player of the year i wonder if i wonder if it's because he he never missed a game so again i, I don't know like this was something someone asked me this on social media and i'm like damn right you know the crazy thing i never even thought about that never even thought about it but i wonder if this is my thinking if it's because it's because he didn't miss a game. That's the only thing I could think of. Most of the guys that win comeback player of the year, they come they win comeback player of the year for one or two reasons. One, they were just terrible. And then all of a sudden they get good and they get it, which I think is really wild. I think it should be more of an injury type of, of thing, or you're coming back from something. Uh, we talk about DeMar Hamlin, uh, the safety from Buffalo Bills. Like he literally died on the field. And I know he's not this stud player for the Buffalo Bills, but he's out there. He's active. He has played in games. He's been inactive for some games. I want to say he was inactive for the last game against the Chiefs, but I would assume he has it locked up. So really anybody else that's up for it is kind of irrelevant. Like he literally died on the field. Like his players, his teammates, they stopped the game for like 30 minutes or however long it was. No, excuse me. They just stopped the game completely. Like they never finished the game because the guy died on the field and they had to spend 10 minutes where his heart wasn't pumping and bring him back to life. Like they literally had to bring him back to life on the field. And to go from that to I'm actually playing football again, uh, I would assume that it's extremely difficult to beat out him for him just coming back, making a roster, even though he's inactive at times, but that is, that is really crazy. That is really crazy. So comeback player of the year, I think is because Brock just didn't miss a game. That's why we don't talk about him. But yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. We got DJ Level. He says the 49ers have the potential to be the first team to ever have five players at 1,000 yards. What five players? What could we got? Eight, four. 
Only four, right? Five. You got Debo, Ayuk, Kittle, McCaffrey. Who else? Who else we talking about? Who else? DJ Level says, uh, hard to be the guy that died and came back for comeback player of the year. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, and some people got upset at this because they're like, well, Alex Smith actually played and he started games and he played good. And it's like, eh, he had a few good games, like, cool. <laughs> yeah, a few good games. But, uh, yeah, he had a few good games, Alex Smith. But, yeah. And same thing. I mean, there's like, once Alex Smith could have played trash, Alex Smith could have played like he was Eric Crocker out there, but uh, play, trying to play quarterback. But the moment he stepped on the field, he was comeback player of the year. Like, they thought they were going to amputate his leg. And they had to take, like, parts of his leg from other areas to put, like, on his shin. The, the moment he stepped on the field, he was going to win. And there's definitely the same thing with DeMar Hellman. We got Manly Shavers. He says, Brown is starting to really step up and ball out. My... My only my only thing with this, right, and he is. I think he's playing well. He's doing his thing. Fans, we cannot turn on a guy the moment something bad does happen. Because that's what I see. Like, the 49er fan base, and this is really all fan bases. Shout out to my guy, um, Quincy Avery. Quincy Avery talked about this with how people are, like, really getting emotional or, like, like turning – Patrick Mahomes into a villain, right? Like, we see that as what's going on right now because he was upset. But the moment, because everybody's good, right? Like, we, we say Brown is starting to step up and he's running the ball out. I saw multiple blown coverages. So if they hit one of those, are we still saying the same thing from him, right? In my opinion, yes, he is stepping up. Yes, he is playing well. Uh, yes, I would like to see the continue to grow. But I don't think that it's just going to be super smooth from here on out for him, like just defense the back in general, there will be times that you get beat. Heck, I've seen how 49er fans, they wanted nothing more but to have anybody other than Diamador Lenore at cornerback. And I think he's playing very well. I think Lenore's playing at a, a – and he's played well at other times. Like it's not just this year or this stretch of games that he's playing well like this. Like We saw him play very well down the stretch last year. We saw him play extremely well in the postseason where it was most important, right? Uh, so, But then let him have an off game and it's like, ah – I knew they should have traded for uh, Johnson, number 33, from the Chicago Bears. Oh, they got to spend their first-round pick on a corner. And it's like, oh, 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 Lord. All right? And I'm not saying you don't need to do that, but we can't be flippy-floppy, especially on secondary guys, because it's just such a difficult position to play. You're going to have your ups and downs. But more times than not, what are they consistent with? And I would say Lenore is being consistently good. Will he get beat here and there? I'd assume that's going to happen. All right, but uh, so far, Lenore has played very well. But I saw how y'all turned on him early in the season. Y'all turned on him, a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, don't turn on him, Brown or Lenore. Shout out to my guy, Johnny Dale Football Academy in the chat. Make sure you guys check out his YouTube channel. Great insight, great, great film study. And once my guy, Greg Pinelli, uh, put his stamp on it, like, Croc, I don't know how this guy knows this stuff, but he is freaking good, Croc. Johnny Dell is the man. Johnny Dell is the man. <laughs> we got DJ Love. He says, people who only be on Madden do that. Like, the, the people that just think everybody's shut down corner. Matter of fact, this is what they think. They think it's, you're either ass and you're number 48, what was his name, Brian Allen, that got, uh, he got dog against the Miami Dolphins for the 49ers. You're either ass like Allen who had just a terrible game, or you are, uh, you know, amazing like um, Darrell Revis. And, like, if you're anything in between, like, the 49 not even 49 fan base, people in general, I always put it out there, like, people hate cornerbacks. They act like they like cornerbacks. People hate cornerbacks. They hate defensive backs. A defensive back touched a guy who's like, where the flag? And he, I actually stopped posting a lot of clips because I'll be like, man, this was a really good rep by the corner. Look how he did this and did this. It's like, well, what about that grab on the jersey? This trash. Like, it should have been a flag. Oh, if it was a better ball. It's like, why do y'all always got to say something to put down the cornerback? Let these dudes go out there and play hard. All right. So, anyways, I saw that to say, I feel like there's no in between. It's either you're uh, this amazing uh, shutdown corner, which really don't exist, 
or you're Brian Allen number 48 in the eyes of fans. When realistically, I go about it more so, is this guy a starting cornerback? Is he a long-term starting cornerback? Or is he more of a depth piece type guy? And I can look at a guy like Dante Johnson, right, for many years. Dante Johnson, a very good depth uh, piece secondary member. Did I need him to be great? Do I need him to be this shutdown guy? No. But, hey, man, you can play safety. You can play slot. You can play outside. You can play wherever I need you. You fill three spots. You can come in. You can do a serviceable job. Okay, let's go. Um, you bring in a guy off the street. Okay, Josh Norman. Do I need Josh Norman to be a shutdown corner? No, but, man, you forced seven fumbles for the 49ers. You know what? For a guy that we got off the streets, I didn't expect you to be this shutdown corner, but you bring some type of value. I like it. Diamond Lenore, man, you're playing outside. You're playing in the slot. You're being versatile for us. Man, you got beat down the field. Like, that's cool. Come back, play well. More times than not, you do. Do I expect you to be Darrell Revis? No. But do I think you're a starting NFL cornerback? I do. I do. So that's how I view it. Then you have the long-term starter guys, you know. And then you have the potential superstar guys, like a Patrick Satan. But I think the way that people view and judge cornerbacks is wild and way off and way off. Forgetting that forgotten athlete podcast says Denzel were probably the best corner in the league, and he get beat from time to time, and he's been the best corner for a minute. Denzel Ward playing extremely well, got paid big time money. Uh, shout out to really Denzel Ward, uh, Greg Newsom, uh, gosh, the kid out of Texas AM, the cornerback. They got a lot of good guys. He's he's the, more the outside guy, and I know Newsom sometimes he's gonna play in the slot, but man, they got a lot of really good pieces there, guys that could really cover on that Bengals back end. We saw the 49ers. They had the 49ers in the straight jacket. Strap City. Strap City. Here we go. We got Khalil Young. He says, Croc, just remember greatness comes in many shapes and sizes. That is true. That is true. That is true. All right. I put the link in the chat. Nobody came on. I think we're going to end this show. I will cut this up into several different segments, about three or four different segments. Uh, again, make sure you guys hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, we're going to be back tomorrow morning. Coach Desi going over any injuries that may have happened. Give her thoughts on some of the Seahawks stuff and moving forward where the 49ers are. A lot of really good stuff. Uh, the link to the audio version will be in this chat. I'm going to start posting the link back so you can listen to it on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to your podcast. Of course, you can also find me on Locked On 49ers five days a week. And don't forget, man, promo code Crocky on the Dog Fantasy. Download the app right now. Double your deposit. Until then, I'm out. Peace.